First, you've heard of war profiteers. Now, how about torture profiteers? A raft of cases are about to be filed against companies in Europe charging collaboration with the U.S. government-backed system of illegal detention and torture. In the U.K., there's about to be an official inquiry. But here? Well, here, last week, the longest surviving accountability case was blocked, like all the others, on the all-too-familiar grounds of, quote, national security. Now a report by Amnesty International charges that up to 30,000 prisoners, including many veterans of the U.S. detention system, are being held with outrights in Iraq, frequently tortured or abused with little redress, no trial. And the U.S. military, with its own dismal record, seems keen to simply hand off and move on. Is that it? Is that the model of democracy the U.S. is selling the world? We'll talk about it with GRIT TV constitutional rights correspondent Vince Warren of the Center for Constitutional Rights, next. CBS projects that Senator Barack Obama of Illinois will be the next president of the United States. He defeats John McCain, the senator... We'll put a link to that Amnesty International report at our website, Vince, but what's your immediate take on what Amnesty International is uh, alleging here and what is the U.S. responsibility for what's now arguably Iraqi detention in Iraqi jails? Well, Laura, it's deeply disturbing, but it's not at all surprising. The United States has professed to lead the world in human rights, uh, and we all know from the last nine years here that they've done a dismal job, particularly with respect to detention without trial. Uh, the response should be that the United States has an obligation to not allow the Iraqi government to repeat what the Bush administration did, to hand over uh, so many men into detention without trial, people who have been in, in jail for a very long time, without any kind of process whatsoever, is exactly what this government should not be doing. And the allegations of torture and abuse are pretty severe. They are. The, the report is, uh, is, is full of information that I think is really important, and I hope that the U.S. government looks at it. But per what's particularly concerning about this is that it's not just the issue of detention during a time of war. These are human rights abuses uh, that the United States is leaving uh, as they pull out of Iraq uh, for a government that seems particularly ill-equipped to do anything about it. Mm. Now, a lot of, or some at least, torture victims have tried to sue the U.S. government to no avail. Uh, the case that I want to talk about next is the case of Binyam Mohammed, a, a British citizen who tried to sue a U.S. corporation, among other people, um, Jepson Air Aviation. Now, this is a guy, well, you tell the story, but he was sent by the U.S. from Pakistan to Morocco where he was tortured, and if you read the details, it's horrific. Things like razor blade slashes of the genitals. This is under U.S. authority. He then goes to Guantanamo, is finally released. There's no case against him. Last February, he's returned to the U.K. What's happened to this case? This is a really particularly troubling case. This is a case that's brought by the ACLU. And as you mentioned, Binya Mohammed uh, was someone who was held in detention for a long time and was brutally beaten. Bones were broken. Uh, people were brought in just to give him severe cuts on his body. And then a stinging liquid was poured into, into the cuts uh, in order to torture him. Now, we have to wrap this in... Uh, and the era of corporate complicity, because this lawsuit challenges that J Jeppesen Data Plan, which is a subsidiary of Boeing, uh, was essentially the taxi service for the CIA in doing these, these horrible, horrible things. What the court did, there was a Ninth Circuit in, uh, in California, and it was split very sharply, six to five, and the court said that the secrets that the U.S. is protecting, Trump uh, Mr. Binya, uh, Binya Muhammad and the other four plaintiffs' ability to even hear their case in court. And what that means for us is that I can come on your show and talk to you about how horrible this is and about the public information about what Jefferson Data Plan did, and we can all talk about it freely, and the only place you can't talk about it is in a U.S. federal court because and they dismissed the case. Under the Bush administration, they would argue, well, you can't call this witness, you can't bring in this information, this information is, is uh, classified. 
But the Obama administration is saying there simply can't even be any kind of a hearing, period. None of this can be talked about. Well, the Bush administration did that too, but I think the Obama administration is developing it into a a fine art. One of the arguments that the Obama administration made was uh, that the court can't hear this case because the, the U.S. government should not be required to confirm or deny that Jeppesen data plan was involved with the CIA. Everybody knows that Jeppesen data plan was involved in the CIA, yet the court, um, in, in dismissing the case, uh, actually in their opinion said, we'd love to tell you the details as to why we think this violates uh, state secrets, but the secrecy re even prevents us from putting that in the opinion. <laughs> so what re recourse do torture victims have in U.S. courts, or are they completely cut off to them? Well, we have to keep fighting, and the courts are one avenue, but I think the, the real area to focus on is the Obama administration. If the Obama administration had, as we had hoped, taken a different tack from the Bush administration, these, courts would, these cases would be seeing the light of day in court. Glenn Greenwald has a very interesting piece, um, and he noted that no case, under no case of uh, the U.S. torture program, has any plaintiff, including the plaintiff at the Center for Constitutional Rights, Meher Arar, had their day in court. Yet recently, um, the Iraqi government has provided $400 million to American victims of Iraqi torture under the Saddam Hussein regime. Now, if that's not a double standard, I don't know what is. Um, the last time you were here, you were talking about the Al-Aqui Al Al case. That's the case of a U.S. citizen who's on the assassination list. Since then, um, I understand Dennis Kucinich has put forward a resolution in the House that the U.S. should, you know, not assassinate U.S. citizens. He only has six co-sponsors? Well, thank goodness for Dennis Kucinich because it clearly he seems to be the only person in Congress that is willing to stand up and to, to, to focus on what the U.S. should be doing. There is no legal justification for assassinating a U.S. citizen without a trial, none whatsoever in terms of domestic law or in terms of international law. And notwithstanding what some people feel about Awalaki, uh, people have, have alleged that uh, he's said all sorts of, of terrible, terrible things, and certainly uh, the human rights groups that are supporting him don't believe in anything uh, approaching targeted uh, assassination or violence for political purposes, but of course that's why we're even opposing this case to begin with. Um, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. public really do, needs to step up and look at this issue and to take a stand. Do we want to live in a place where the U.S. government can torture people and kill people at will, or do we not? And what about looking at what's on your laptop? Um, there was an interesting exchange earlier this year between the Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano and Russ Feingold over detentions and laptop surveillance at the U.S. border with Canada. Take a look. In the course of the very few laptop searches that actually have been done, and it, and it has been a very small number that actually have been conducted, uh, they have found some fairly significant criminal activity on, on some laptops. But moving forward, we're a global society, people going from country to country all the time, they're crossing the border, they need to take their laptops to do business. We need to have a better policy that takes into account some of those IP concerns, some of the privacy concerns. That's what we're drafting now. Well, Madam Secretary, I don't have any doubt that you search of uh, laptops uh, just sort of indiscriminately, you're going to find some good stuff. But that's not the way we do business in this country. That's not the way we do business. That's hearings actually from last year. But the ACLU this year has brought a lawsuit on behalf of a McGill doctoral student who was detained at the border with pictures on his laptop having to do with his research into Islamic Shiite studies. His laptop was kept for 11 days. Is any of that right? 11 days. It, it, it's outrageous. And what we need to realize, especially with respect to Fourth Amendment law and with respect to border searches, is that in this day and age, our entire lives are not in our homes. They're in our laptops. They're in our cell phones. They're in our PDA advice, devices. And if we were to allow the government uh, in a border search uh, to decide to detain your information for 11 days, and I understand that this, this young man missed his train. He was, he was traveling by train. They kept him there. He was left in the middle of nowhere uh, because the U.S. government thought we might be able to find something that's good here. And it particularly is problematic because there was information and communications with him and his girlfriend, I understand, and that he's doing research. And we don't want to penalize people that are doing research on information that we need to know. Heaven forbid we get more information or better understanding. Vince Warren, thanks so much for joining us. We'll put a link to the Center for Constitutional Rights and the cases we've discussed at our website, grittv.org.